Can there be any victim more innocent than a baby? Can there be any death more tragic than that of a sick child entrusted to the life-saving care of medical professionals? Can there be any more crime more heinous than the murder of an infant? To those who do unthinkable things like that, they never get away with it and are always captured or punished. But one case still haunts this hospital in Canada and the scariest thing is that the murderer was never captured. This is the case of the Toronto Hospital baby murders. Now I'm gonna be honest, this case is really disturbing because nobody knows who did this evil act. But there are some suspicions later in this video. In Canada, there is a medical center which is home to the largest pediatric research facility and some of the best experts in their own skills. This place is called Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children or it can be called HSC for short. This place was really good. This place really had a good reputation and it excelled in any other hospitals in the country. It was credited innovations in the fields of infant nutrition, pasteurization, surgical procedures, and gene therapy. If your child was sick during this time, then you would have wanted them to be here. But something tragically happened in 1980 and 1981, and for nine long months, the hospital went through traumatic stress. Along in a cardiac ward, the mortality rate in the hospital jumped not up to 50 or 100%, but up to 600%. And during that time, 43 babies had died during that year. The first of these deaths occurred on the night of June 30th, 1980, when 18 day old Laura Woodcock went into cardiac arrest. All attempts to resuscitate the baby failed. Laura died that same night. At the time, her death was considered an unavoidable tragedy. No one suspected that it might be anything sinister. But for the next two months, there would be at least 20 infant deaths. And this still didn't alert the hospital authorities until some nurses expressed their concerns. Then the hospital would start taking action, but it wasn't going to get to the bottom of the unexplained deaths, but rather to help perceive moral issues to the nurses. But this didn't even help, and the killings continued, and the next death was this kid named Kevin Pascai, a 24-day-old child who had come for a checkup for an abnormal heartbeat. It was not even life-threatening, and the doctors were going to discharge him in two days. His father, Kevin Garnett, was broken, and he wanted answers. He was talking with Dr. Rodney Fowler in an emotional state and started punching the walls. Dr. Fowler was shaken and he started suspecting that this wasn't an accident and that somebody could have done this unthinkable thing. The concerns of all the nurses, the unexplained deaths of the children and everything started to click and add up. He brought the attention to the upper staff and he promised Kevin that he would help him and he did. He demanded that the boy would have an autopsy. The little boy had 13 times the normal level of dioxin in his bloodstream. Dioxin is a drug used to regulate heart rhythm. It can be fatal if taken in excess amounts, and the levels detected in the baby's tiny corpse certainly qualified as excessive. On March 21, 1981, the police were called in. At this time, no one was pointing fingers at the medical staff, but investigators took the cardiac nursing team on a three-day furlough. Officers were searching lockers, studying work schedules, to see which nurses was on the clock during the baby's death. During this investigation, a little boy named Justin Cook went into cardiac arrest and then died. An autopsy was performed, and again, it detected elevated levels of digoxin. In fact, Justin had a digoxin level of 100, and he wasn't even prescribed a drug. If the authorities had harbored any doubts before, they were certain now. There was a child killer on the wards, and the attention of investigators would soon be drawn to one person. Nurse Susan Niels had been on duty at the time of 24 suspicious death, all of them occurring during the aptly named graveyard shift between 1 and 5 a.m. However, that alone wasn't what aroused suspicion. It was Niels Bazaar's reaction to each of these tragedies. Mary Mandel, a colleague of Susan, said that after a fifth death of a child, she said, Not a bad record, huh? And some nurses would come out and say that while they were crying during a child's death, she was just in the side and smirking. This hardly counts as evidence, but the police team led by Sergeant Jack Press knocked on Neil's apartment door and identified them as authorities from the coroner's office. Neil's roommate, a law student at the time, advised Neil's to not speak with authorities until she could do so with the lawyer. Sergeant Press however warned Neil's that whatever she would say would be written down and used against her. This is how the conversation with Sergeant Press and Nels went. Okay, Justin Cook died of an overdose of digoxin, a drug he wasn't supposed to have. 
You believe you gave him the drug and would like to know why. Do you wish to give an explanation of his being? Given dioxin? Nails. I want to speak to a lawyer. The interaction led to Nails being arrested for first degree murder in the death of Justin Cook on March 25th. Susan Nails was arrested and charged with the murders of three babies, Kevin Pascai, Janice Estrella, and Alana Miller. Each of these infants had been found to have elevated levels of digoxin, even though they were never prescribed any of it. Susan Nels was placed on administrative leave after her arrest, but her removal from HSC did nothing to stop the troubling incidents at the hospital. On September 1981, senior nurse Phyllis Trainer found capsules of the heart regulator propranolol in the salad she was eating in the staff cafeteria. Another nurse, Sue Scott, found capsules of the same medication in her own soup. Trainer later reported that someone had drawn crosses in red lipstick on her hospital locker and on her car. These incidents terrified the staff. Rumors abound of a maniac stalking the hospital corridors, targeting random victims. No one felt safe. The prosecution of Susan Nels went ahead at a preliminary hearing on July 11, 1982. Prosecutors cited 16 additional baby deaths that were carbon copies of the three Nels stood accused of. However, the case was going in her favor, and it was starting to fall apart. She may have been guilty of inappropriate responses to the children's death, but there was not a shred of evidence that she had harmed any of them. No one had seen her interacting inappropriately with the victims, and there was nothing to link her to the missing stocks of digoxin. Later than that, the judge dismissed all the charges against her. He also called her an excellent nurse with an exemplary record, but the judge did say that there are questions that need answering and the case is still open. Even years later, there are so many questions that all need answering, such as what happened to the grieving parents? Where could they go for answers? Who was the sick person that did this? Police still fear that the killer behind this is still in the ward and possibly still working there. Some people started pointing fingers to Phyllis Trainer. Since Susan was out, and a nurse had come out and said that she saw Phyllis inject an unidentified drug in the feeder bottle, who was Alana Miller. Later at midnight, March 20th, 1981, the little girl died and needed an autopsy and found digoxin. Questioned by police, Trainer denied the allegation, and the police left it at that. As when Susan nails, they had no real evidence to back up their allegations. Phyllis Trainer died in 2011. She was never charged with any wrongdoing in the deaths the HSC babies. The HSC baby murders had never been solved. In fact, there are some who believe that these were not murders at all, but natural deaths. All hospitals see spikes in their mortality rate from time to time. Perhaps 1980 to 1981 was just a bad period for HSC. But what then of the autopsy reports? What then of the CDC findings, all but confirming mass murders? What of babies giving lethal doses of a drug that had never even been prescribed to them? No, whatever the naysayers may say, this is definitely a case of murder. A serial killer was active at HSC during those dreadful nine months. A serial killer who evaded justice. Although no charges were laid, the case had immense impact on the hospital. Officials were criticized by both Supreme Court Justice Charles Dublin, as well as the CDC in Atlanta for not recognizing the deaths as soon as possible. However, the assistant administrator for sick kids at the team defended the hospital claiming, it is not normal for a hospital to think foul play has been expected. Following the inquest, Sick Kids Executive Director Douglas Shedden shared that new safety measures were added in response to the scandal. These include a unit dose system for dispensing all drugs from the hospital pharmacy and ID badges for all hospital staffs and visitors. The Toronto Hospital for Sick Children continues to be a leading light in the world of pediatric medicine. It is exactly the place you want your child to be. Should he or she require medical care here? As of now, the creepiest thing is that the killer was never captured and is out just preying on victims, maybe even still working in a hospital punishment free. I'm pretty sure this case will never be solved and will just remain a mystery. For me personally, the hospital itself shouldn't be the one to be blamed, as it's time they knew what they were dealing with, it was already too late, and hope those kids rest in peace. Now since the video has ended, I just want to say thank you guys for 100 subscribers, it really means a lot to me, and thank you guys for the positive feedback in the last video and stay tuned for more.
have a happy new year